Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Back in 1747, Julien Afroy de la Metri wrote an influential book called Man a Machine. This is, I think, in the Enlightenment period in Europe, one of the first works to come out strongly in favor of being an atheist. There were hints by various people that maybe God wasn't all he was cracked up to be, but still this was absolutely clear, man a machine, that God didn't exist. We human beings are more like machines than embodied spirits. The 18th century was a big time for machines in France and the rest of Europe, so this is a vivid metaphor at the time. And Delametri was not one of the world's great philosophers, but he was, he was more like a pundit, I guess we would say, in these days. He had very vivid metaphors and language and examples. He put his case in a very clear way for people to understand. I remember one of the points that he made, I'm paraphrasing now, it's been years since I read it, but basically he was arguing against Rene Descartes' idea of mind-body dualism that a human being is a body, but then there's also a mind that is disembodied, and somehow they talk to each other, and that makes the person. So Delametri didn't buy this. He basically would say that the human being is a physical object, and the mind is emergent in our modern language. But the example he used was he says, look, when I have had my cup of coffee, or not had my cup of coffee, I'm a different person, depending on whether that's happened or not. How can you possibly believe that the mind is completely separate from the body when it's perfectly clear that my mind is deeply affected by what happens to my body. It's a very good point, really, when, and of course, the people who don't believe him have answers to it, etc., but nevertheless, the example lingers in your mind. These days, when we know even more about how the brain works, how the body works, how the mind works, but still don't know nearly enough, we're advancing in the direction of understanding not just how the mind works, but how to change how the mind works by messing with it, by giving it coffee or giving it other sorts of substances. So today I'm talking to Robin Carhart Harris, who is head of the Center for Psychedelic Research in the Division of Brain Sciences at Imperial College London. Robin is one of the first people, maybe the first people, to study the effects of LSD and other psychedelic drugs on patients in controlled clinical trials. I should say he and his collaborators, right? It's medicine. There's a lot of people working on this. But for years now, following the dictates of the United Nations of all people, most countries have just held all research into psychedelics off limits. And those rules are finally beginning to soften a little bit. So we can do things like give a patient some LSD or some psilocybin, put them in an MRI machine and see what's happening to their brain. We're learning a lot. We're learning about both how the brain works for its own purposes. We're curious about that. But we're also learning about how there might be therapeutic advantages to using drugs like this. There was a certain reputation that psychedelics got in the 60s and the 70s, and that gave them a bad image as far as public relations is concerned. But there's enormous potential here for using these for treating depression, for treating addiction, for end-of-life care, for pain management, or just for helping people sort of become at peace with themselves in different ways. It's very early days, I think, for the research here, and we really don't know. That's why it's so fascinating to start thinking about it. So remember, the podcast, Mindscape, has a web page, preposterousuniverse.com slash Mindscape, where you can get not just the show notes for this, links to people's web pages and their research publications or what have you, but also full transcripts of all the episodes. There are links you can click on if you want to donate or things like that. People who donate and become Patreon members don't get ads on their podcasts, and they also get monthly Ask Me Anything episodes. And with that, let's go. Robin Carhart Harris, welcome to Mindscape Podcast. Thank you. Nice to be here. So um, there's a lot to discover here about uh, psychedelics and therapies in the brain and things like that. But this is a topic unlike some that I do where I'm presuming that many of the listeners either have experience or opinions. At least they know what LSD and magic mushrooms and things like that are. Uh, so, but but there's a history that I think is fascinating. Why, why don't you say a few words about the history about you know how these things came to be and also the legal uh, choices that made it difficult to study them over the years? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess the history comes in a few phases. Uh, people have talked about waves. You know, you have the first wave of uh, psychedelic plant medicine use, which is ancient and, mm. uh, you know, major geographical areas in, in Central America and South America where psychedelic plant medicines have been used for, you know, countless generations. Um, and, Do we uh, know a lot about how deep that goes back in the history of uh, um, those things in South America? Uh, some people do. It's not my area <laughs> not my of particular area. Okay. expertise, yeah. but it goes back to uh, uh, with mushrooms. Uh, um, I think it's fair to say thousands of years mm. in Central America Okay, in terms of mushroom-related artifacts. I mean, they could be something else, but they look pretty sure. mushroom-like. Right. All right. Uh, and um, uh, pictures as well that uh, go back a long way um, that depict um, mushroom ingestion. Okay. Uh, ayahuasca, it's difficult to know um, because of uh, perhaps a lack of artifacts, um, but at least, you know, several hundred years back uh, and very much ingrained in certain cultures in uh, Peru and Br Brazil. Um, yeah, uh, and then... But then LSD, for example, we discovered in the 20th yeah, century, right? That we was, did. That was yeah. made. Yeah, so Albert Hoffman, uh, who was kind of commissioned by a drugs company, Sandos, to uh, play around with some ergot derivatives. That was his expertise. So ergot's a fungus that grows on certain mm -hmm. uh, grasses, rye grass, um, and was associated with, you know, some interesting vascular effects and also some intoxication as well, um, poisoning. Um, uh, and so uh, he was looking at uh, the potential vascular effects of the drugs, um, uh, potentially related to uh, stemming bleeding in, in birth. Okay. Um, and so he wasn't looking for mental effects. No, he wasn't. So it was a classic you know medical serendipity that led yeah. him to and when was this this is 1938 he was playing around okay. with the the drugs the war happened things got shelved <laughs> and it was 43 when he uh now famously uh took was it 200 or 250 micrograms which he thought was a tiny amount of lsd turns out that's a pretty big trip <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then uh the, the um now celebrated bicycle day the first bicycle day happened then in april i think the 19th 1943 mm -hmm. he took that dose of lsd and was shocked at the effects thought he was dying um actually before he got there he jumped on his bike and rapidly cycled home because he you know, wanted <laughs> somewhere comfortable perhaps if he was felt he was on the on his way out but uh it was it describes what sounds like a quite a nightmarish experience his neighbor comes around and she turns into a malevolent witch who he thinks poisoned him um and yeah he he, he uh, thinks he's dying and yeah so that's the second wave and now we're in this renaissance period the so-called third wave so uh, um and in between uh we have the 1960s and <laughs> a good uh, time in some yeah, sense for a good time in some sense and but uh, i guess a sad time in another sense in terms of the pushback right. against psychedelic drugs which had very significant implications for psychedelic drug research and medical use uh, leading to essentially a an outright ban on any kind of work with psychedelics from uh, the late 60s onwards and it's been decades, really, of a hiatus in research until, I guess, in the 90s, most significantly, you have characters like Rick Strassman and Franz Vollenweider um, doing pioneering work to bring uh, psychedelic compounds back into the scientific space. And then, and then the noughties, you know, with uh, significant things happening at Johns Hopkins, uh, I guess we come onto the scene in the UK in the late noughties, around 2009. Mm -hmm. I started uh, brain imaging research with psilocybin. Um, and we find ourselves here today where, you know, this is starting really to become quite mainstream. And it was banned 
internationally in the 60s, right? There was some, like the United Nations, uh, put, yeah. uh, they don't have much legal authority, but they did at least recommend that countries not let you use psychedelics for therapeutic purposes. Is that? Yeah, it was a idea? UN-wide initiative. So any countries that fell firmly under that were implicated, and that's most Western countries. Yeah. Uh, in the Eastern Bloc, actually, they carried on for a little bit longer doing yeah. work in the Czech Republic and a certain Stanislav Grof, who's you know, such a key figure in in psychedelic uh, work, um, he carried on doing research with LSD into the early seventies, but then that dried up as well. And was it is it true that part of that was actually a backlash, literally against hippies using LSD and protesting yeah. Vietnam and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, there's a few conspiracy theories, but uh, I don't think you have to be too. Uh, inventive in your imagination to see how these things fit together um, and it was a time of particular um, social and political conflict uh, in the US uh, uh, very polarized um, and uh, it seems there was a fear that perhaps psychedelics were fueling some of the countercultural mm. uh, sentiments um, uh, yeah and uh, Probably just a, a few things were going on um, in terms of uh, uh, certain politicians seeing that it can be a potent, uh, you know, vote winner to uh, be seen as being hard on drugs. Top you on know. crime, yeah, top on Yeah, drugs. exactly. And, and I guess Nixon sort of embodied that with yeah. his uh, war on drugs. Um, and before that, I don't know, with LBJ, it was him really who, who started to, you know, uh, curtail things um, and uh, maybe it was Vietnam and a fear of uh, um, people not being so loyal and obedient mm. and perhaps having a bit of an anti-authoritarian spirit mm. and that being tied up with the whole psychedelic and drug use thing. Okay, but now we're sitting here in your office at Imperial College in London where you do research on uh, these substances. Presumably it's legal. Did they change the law or did you get an exception? Or yeah, what it's an exception. Uh, you get a license from the Home Office. Okay. Um, and uh, it's not trivial to get one and they're quite expensive. And that's a shame because it hampers uh, science, hampers collaboration. It's not easy just to send some drug off to another team or, or take it over to them. And, you know, they need to be recognized and listed with the home office. And if they're setting up, they have to set aside a few thousand pounds to, to mm. uh, and a bit of building work. You need a fridge that's locked, bolted to the wall and, <laughs> and there are inspections and such yeah. like. And these things might seem kind of trivial, but you have to be really motivated to make them happen. Right. And it's quite easy, you know, with all the relevant pressures that you have in any domain, but in academia, uh, uh, to just not bother, you yeah. know? And and so... It's hard enough for me to get a grant to do theoretical cosmology, much less, you know, uh, get get a drug, you know, visiting uh, sense to the lab must yeah. be a whole other thing. Well, yeah. grant winning has been so difficult, I yeah. think. There's only been one or i mean the the medical research council in the uk supported our depression work uh and that's kind of an exception nihr in the uk have um uh, supported a colleague of mine um so that was a year ago or so so things might be changing but i i know not much has happened in in the us with uh, nimh uh, and uh you know you have some obvious um uh, absentees there in terms of major funding bodies yeah. uh, that haven't supported this and that's got to change soon. I want to pause for a second to talk about policygenius.com. If you're like me, buying insurance is something that you know is really necessary, but you don't look forward to it. It's a mess. There are a lot of different choices out there. You're not sure which policy to buy, etc. PolicyGenius.com makes all that very easy. It makes getting the right life insurance or home insurance, auto insurance, disability insurance, all that stuff will be a breeze. One thing it does is it compares insurance policies from different insurers so you can see exactly how much things cost, what gets covered, and you can choose what will be best for you. And then the people at Policy Genius will handle all of the paperwork and the red tape so you don't have to spend your valuable time worrying about that stuff. 
stuff. So as 2020 begins, you can check something off your to-do list if you haven't quite gotten this done yet. Go to Policy Genius, get life insurance. It takes just a few minutes to find your best price and apply at policygenius.com. Policy Genius will always get the future wrong, so why not get life insurance right? So let's um, explain to people what actually happens when a person takes some of these psychedelics. For one thing, is it fair just to use the catch-all phrase psychedelics, or do we need to really distinguish between the different ones we could take? Yeah, I think we need to distinguish. It's a very sort of broad-brushed term. There's this extended definition of psychedelic, which I guess in a sense exploits uh, the, the word itself, uh, the etymology there, psychedelic means mind manifesting or mind revealing. Um, uh, and so people might say, oh, when you smoke cannabis, you can have these major psychological insights. And when you take MDMA, you can have insights mm. and some self-realization. So under you know um, that definition, we'll, we'll extend the definition of psychedelic to, to the, include these compounds. Another way of but so but sorry but technically most people who do psychedelic research would not include marijuana for example I wouldn't because you know I guess it's the science thing where you, you know you need to be crisp in your definitions mm -hmm. and uh, and so for me the best scientific definition is one that that comes from the pharmacology which is classic psychedelics and some examples there would be LSD arguably the prototypical psychedelic because it was only after its discovery that the term came along. Mescaline as well, given that uh, uh, Humphrey Osmond came up with the word in, um, he was a, a Canadian, well, he was British psychiatrist working in Canada. Uh, he became friends with Aldous Huxley of oh, yeah. um, A Brave New World and The Doors of Perception, right. which was his essay on his mescaline experience okay and the mescaline was provided by humphrey osmond and right. so from that there was you know a, a realization shared realization that we needed a new term for this category of drugs osmond came up with psychedelic um mm -hmm. and uh but yeah so mescaline you know <laughs> played a, a role in the birth of that term as well a key role uh, so LSD as a as a tryptamine and and tryptamines are uh, compounds that molecularly are very similar to serotonin, 5-hydroxy uh, tryptamine, um, and uh, another one is dimethyl tryptamine, uh, okay. DMT, which is found endogenously in some very small amounts uh, in humans and and you know many other animals we think and lots of plant species. Um, uh, DMT is the major psychedelic ingredient in ayahuasca, this Amazonian okay. brew. Yep. So there's some examples, but the, the crisp definition is that all of these classic psychedelics um, share a certain pharmacological property, which is that they stimulate a certain serotonin receptor, the serotonin 2A receptor. And then I could say a lot of I think, interesting things about the 2A receptor, where it is in the brain, what it's associated with. I think you should say those interesting things. Yeah, where is it in the brain? So what is, okay. I mean, this is a neuroreceptor in individual neurons? Yeah, yeah, it sits in the membrane of individual neurons. Um, and the first thing to say is that the receptor is heavily expressed in the cortex, um, that aspect of brain that humans have so much of, all the wrinkly mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, massively expanded in our species, um, and that's where you find these these key receptors that psychedelics work on. So we're going to be more susceptible to psychedelics than cats and dogs. Or, Probably yeah. they seem sensitive too, but they don't. You know, their behavioural repertoire is <laughs> who would know <laughs> they can't really. Talk, you know, <laughs> so they just twitch and that yeah. kind of thing, and that's our <laughs> behavioural index of whether dogs and rodents are, are, are <laughs> tripping or not. Um, yeah, in humans, uh, we have lots of cortex, we have lots of 2A, serotonin 2A is the receptor. Um, and uh, it's not uh, entirely evenly distributed in the cortex. The cortex, like so much of the brain and so much of the body and nature, is hierarchical, mm -hmm. uh, has a hierarchical organization. 
And at the top of the hierarchy, you have the association cortex, which in a sense is the most mysterious because it doesn't have an obvious modular function like the visual system, for example, you know, which most of the visual systems in the back of the brain. Right. It's clear what that does. Yeah. And the motor uh, uh, systems for move, movement, motor action. But the association cortex is sort of like a lot of a lot of things and uh, and associated with association and high level uh, psychological functions like imagination. Um, so stitching things together and coming up with yeah. scenarios. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stitching things together, imagining things that aren't there immediately mm -hmm. in the environment. So that's referred to as counterfactual thinking. Mm -hmm. um, something that people say might be unique to our species. Mm -hmm. Another thing that people say is probably unique to our species, at least in the magnitude that we have it, is self-consciousness. Right. Probably what sets us apart. And that's where, you know, that's a function associated with the association cortex when you see so much of these 2A receptors. So that's a good starting point. You know, the receptors in an aspect of the brain that evolutionarily is quite recent and massively, you know, expanded in our species and associated with these high level functions. Uh, then we could look at what happens when you stimulate that receptor to brain function. And there... I've introduced a notion which I hope is useful of, of this entropic brain idea. Oh, okay. Uh, where entropy... We're big fans of the word entropy here in the I Mindscape podcast. So. You are. <laughs> and this is where, um, in a sense, I'm stretching my expertise because it's not in physics but uh, or in information theory. But I know that in uh, information theory, entropy is uh, um, quite a fundamental metric uh, related to our uncertainty about um, a system mm -hmm. uh, where if entropy is high, uncertainty is high, we don't know what that system's going to do next. Right. It's unpredictable. Um, and there the principle with psychedelics is quite simple, this entropic brain principle, which is that psychedelics um, increase the unpredictability of spontaneous brain activity. Okay. So rather than spontaneous just means ongoing, rather than evoked by like a stimulus of some sort. Right. So that um, even when we're trying to be quiet and stilling our minds, there's a lot going on yeah, in our brain. Yeah. So that's yeah. our spontaneous brain activity. Okay. Um, and you can think of, uh, you know, stream of consciousness and imagination, daydreaming, those mm -hmm. kind of things going on. Um, yeah. And uh, the stuff that you're trying to get a, a control over in a mindfulness exercise or at least yeah, get knowledge of. You try and right? still. Um, with focus. Yeah. There's a few kind of interesting paradoxes there, <laughs> of course. Um, but uh, ordinarily, uh, you know, that quality of consciousness is pretty rich, but under psychedelics, we found it's richer still. Mm. And we found that there's this interesting, really quite reliable relationship between the richness of ongoing consciousness, if you want, and ongoing brain activity. Where I mean, maybe even before we get there, is there what is the role of serotonin in the cortex other than psychedelics? It, it naturally appears, and it, yeah. you know what it's there for. Well, serotonin is a really complex neuromodulator, so it, it tunes uh, neural function rather than it being a simple um, excitation or inhibition thing. It's more about a complex tuning, and uh, the complexity of serotonin is reflected in its number of sub receptors there are at least 14 that have been identified and they all do quite different things mm. uh, some of them actually oppose each other's function okay. another thing that yeah. you see in nature <laughs> um, and uh, the 2a uh, receptor is excitatory um, uh, and it seems to increase a, a irregular form of excitation and there might be a clue as to what we see at the population level so groups of neurons where we see this entropic uh, effect mm. where the activity becomes harder to predict more complex right in the presence of the serotonin or in the presence of psychedelics so uh well it, it there's in terms of the basal the functioning of the serotonin to a receptor this the 
suggestion is that it, it doesn't do that much because if you give a blocker of the 2A receptor, it doesn't really do much to consciousness. Okay. It might make you a little bit sedated, might make your thinking a little bit uh, narrowed and stereotyped, but it's a subtle effect, um, cognitive rigidity, um, mm. but it's quite subtle. So that's the low entropy, high predictability yeah. kind of phase. Yeah. Yeah. And it might be associated, I guess, by implication with a, a narrowing of the range of conscious content, let's mm -hmm. say. Uh, 2A blockers in medicine, uh, antipsychotics often have a 2A blocking component and some sleep drugs as well. 2A blockade seems to promote deep sleep. Okay. So it's kind of the opposite of what you see with psychedelics, yeah. but it, but then there is this rule of it doesn't, the blockers don't seem to do that much. They don't, certainly don't, you know, it's not the dramatic impact on consciousness that you see when you stimulate that receptor. Which is what the psychedelics do. Yeah. yeah. And so part of the, part of my thinking and, and I think others around the 2A receptor is that maybe it becomes engaged naturally during exceptional conditions. If it's not really doing much basally, so, you know, in a kind of ongoing uh, background mm -hmm. kind of way, then maybe it's there for some kind of emergency situations, perhaps crises. And uh, I've got a paper in development at the moment which um, proposes that hypothesis. And I've written other things that have sort of led up to that hypothesis, that it's a kind of crisis button in a way, you know, activating the 2A system, the serotonin 2A system. And so in conditions of, as somebody else has said, existential distress crises, <laughs> maybe you need to induce these very plastic brain and mind states. Mm, because, the brain be more flexible. Yeah, because your life literally depends on it. Uh, or, you know, your, uh, I guess, well-being uh, um, very much depends on it. Like something has to give, something needs to change. You've, you're having some kind of psychological breakdown for whatever complex reasons. You're, you enter this state of hyperplasticity, uh, and and then beyond that, maybe life is is never the same again. Okay. You can think of examples like uh, epiphanies, religious epiphanies, yeah. Yeah. hitting rock bottom, and major transformative experiences, they happen, you know, outside of the context of psychedelics. So it's natural to ask, why do they happen? How do they happen? Maybe they happen in a related way to how psychedelics work. Okay. And so um, when we take the psychedelics, and so now we are grouping all the psychedelics together in this conversation. Should we should we be more careful about uh, well, yeah, distinguishing I mean, uh, which one does what? Yeah. When I talk about psychedelics, I'm really talking about the classic psychedelics. Yeah. And there, I think it's probably most useful for listeners to think of the examples. LSD, psilocybin, which is found in magic mushrooms, DMT, which is found in lots of plants mm -hmm. and in ayahuasca. Uh, mescaline is a phenethylamine, it's a slightly different class, but it's still a classic psychedelic. Okay, so all these stimulate these this particular serotonin receptor. Yeah. And so uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I didn't quite get clear what, how I should think about what this is doing to the brain. So there's a lot of things going on in our brain, even when we're trying to be quiet or our eyes are closed or whatever. And my impression is that the psychedelics, uh, rather than excite the brain, they sort of let the brain have some access to what's going on anyway, in some sense. Is that fair? Yeah, it is fair. It is an excitation, but it's a it's an irregular form of excitation. So perhaps rather than think of it in a quantitative way, you know, where people have historically, they, they talk about regions in the brain lighting up mm. uh, or metabolism increasing or decreasing a little bit like some like a thermostat or something, you know, going hotter or colder. That's a little bit of, a, these days, a bit of too crude a way to depict uh, the brain where it, it might be better to think of the quality of brain activity changing. Okay. And there, the thing to say is that the regularity of brain activity changes. Activity becomes uh, dysregulated. That's right. I do remember reading about, you know, the network effects in the brain become a little bit less uh, predictable, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And does that have an easy relationship to the classic 
things that we think of as happening when we're on an LSD trip in terms of hallucinations, uh, visual and auditory, or even, um, I mean, sometimes people see things that are, that are just not there. Many times people just see things that are there moving in weird ways, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that notion that psychedelics are hallucinogens, a little bit misleading mm -hmm. with eyes open, things distort. Yeah. And sure, things can sort of emerge if you're looking at something like the clouds or whatever, or you're on DMT and then things are really wild visually. Um, but uh, it's more when you close your eyes that the experience becomes very rich in imagery and very, very vivid, uh, as if one is seeing with their eyes closed. Mm -hmm. um, a bit like dreaming. Mm. Uh, is it a bit like dreaming or is it really the same thing as dreaming in some sense? Uh, it's probably a hybrid. Yeah. Uh, it's, not the, it's not quite the same thing, but uh, I've speculated and others have, and there's bits of indirect evidence to back this up, that the tripping state, if you want, is a hybrid waking dream state. Mm, okay. And so part of the uh, mechanics and physiology of dreaming is actually happening while you're awake under a psychedelic. Um, uh, and there, you know, in the same, and this actually is probably the reason that drew me into this whole area in the first place, in the same way that Sigmund Freud famously said of dreams that there were a royal road to a knowledge of the unconscious mind. Um, Others have said the same, Stan Groff and others, about uh, psychedelics. Mm. And then you put two and two together and you think, ah, by, you know, a matter of kind of converging evidence, there's something to this unconscious mind business. Yeah. yeah. One of the reasons I started Mindscape was because I had too many books to read. And by having the authors of these books as podcast guests, I would force myself to do it. For those of you who don't have podcasts of your own, you might want to try the Blinkist app. Blinkist is a wonderful way to get a glimpse into what a book is saying without going through the whole thing, without having to read the entire book. Basically, in 15 minutes of reading, you can get an essence for what the book is actually about. Some of my books are on Blinkist, and also other books by previous Mindscape guests. There are books by Carlo Rovelli, Adam Rutherford, and others. So with Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books, all the books you want and for one low price. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for Mindscape listeners. Go to Blinkist.com slash Mindscape to try it free for seven days and save 25% off your new subscription. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Mindscape to start your seven-day free trial. And you'll also save 25% off, but only when you sign up at Blinkist.com slash Mindscape. Probably a lot of people who are not professional neuroscientists or psychologists have a, a, a pretty overly simplistic, direct view of how the brain works. Like there's a visual field that comes in and we have a camera in our brains and there it is, right? And we hear things and, and that's also going on at the same time. But my impression from my rather amateurish readings in these things, it's, it's way more complicated and there's a lot of processing going on in the brain just to give us this this image of the world that we see around us, right? Like the, the what we think we're seeing is highly processed compared to what our eyes and visual cortex actually picks up. Absolutely. I mean, you could say it's highly constructed hmm. um, in a kind of top-down way, as in there's a, a lot that we're experiencing that comes from the brain itself rather than from the outside world. And this is what, you know, Carl Friston will say mm -hmm. when you have yeah. him on. Uh, hopefully in a in a very elegant and thoughtful and precise way, <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps in a way that's difficult to understand. But uh, um, no, there's this notion the Bayesian brain, uh, um, based on principles of probability, that um, we house in our brains internal models through which we experience the world, and so much of experience is the product, in a sense, of these models that we house rather than some kind of receptivity of information coming in. Right. And, and the action of psychedelics is a bit of a clue to that being uh, true um, in the sense that we can almost see these models that we've constructed, even the really high-level ones like our sense of self. 
Right. And that's probably the most profound realization that people have on psychedelics is, oh, my goodness, you know, my <laughs> my sense of personality is an absolute, um, uh, you know, uh, and uh, all the, you know, spiritual um, related uh, um, sort of uh, follow follows on things that follow on from from that experience yeah. come into play. Yeah. Yeah, so we should think of what is happening to our brains on psychedelics, you know, not as seeing new things, but as you're, you're you seem to be implying that we're revealing things that are going on inside our brain already. Yeah, it's almost like an outside observer. You can look at sort of, in a sense, how the brain and mind work. Um, and these it's probably achieved through the fact that these internal models break down. Mm hmm. Uh, Recently, I've written with Carl on this topic, a, a review paper that we've entitled Rebus for Relaxed Beliefs Under Psychedelics. Oh, okay, nice. <laughs> Bit of a fudge. but well, um, psychedelics is not an S, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah, it sounds that way. Uh, but it's uh, hopefully it's memorable. Um, uh, and yeah, the idea is that the um, what's called precision weighting or confidence uh, that we have in our internal models so like our confidence in who we are mm -hmm. uh, dissolves, breaks down, relaxes mm. under psychedelics. Um, and when that happens, there is this, uh, you know, curious um, uh, possibility to step outside of the model and then almost sort of view it or view its, realize its absence and uh almost have a third person perspective on our first yeah. person oh, it throws up <laughs> lots of interesting <laughs> philosophical questions like then who is the observer right um uh but well i talked to daniel dennett recently on the podcast and so you know he is one of the originators of this multiple drafts version uh image of consciousness where there's a lot going on that are sort of suggested ways of viewing the world in your brain. And then this, I guess, this associative part of your cortex knits them together to make some uh, final draft. But uh, yeah, so if you know one of them is the final story, I guess. And if you if, if you get to look at them individually, you realize how non-unitary our, our selves really are. Yeah. Yeah. How the, the narrative has been stitched together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Multiple drafts. Yeah. And does this, you know, a lot of people have... Uh, advocated the use of psychedelics for unleashing creativity in some way does, it, mm. does this speak to that do you, do you agree that this is a good uh, kind of thing to do yeah probably the you know the biggest block to creativity is being too sure mm. being too confident you know too low entropy <laughs> yeah yeah and uh you know um which is it's a it's a curious one and you can think of other drugs that work perhaps even in a sort of polar opposite way to psychedelics that give confidence, you know, the stimulants, maybe a drug like cocaine. Mm -hmm. um, we've actually um, published some work that uh, based on a, on a scale of ego dissolution and ego inflation, these two drugs go in different directions. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah it's so kind of an obvious you, thing. Yeah, but, I guess, mate. I, but... Yeah, so it makes you a little bit more sure of yourself. Yes, <laughs> it inflates the ego. Um, I see. Yeah. It makes you maybe less creative? Possibly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you because might be very potential... productive. Right, exactly. But yeah. you might come up with a lot of stereotypes, you know, huh. manic kind of ramblings that aren't particularly rangy and expansive. Uh, whereas with psychedelics, you really get that expansion. Whether you can get the focus <laughs> right, exactly, is, another, yes. is another matter. Um, I mean, there's the classic example of being on psychedelics and thinking that you've had a wonderful insight and you try to write something down and the next day it's just nonsense, right? Yeah, yeah. There's, then the, yeah, the quality control comes in, the, <laughs> the BS detector, uh, the editor uh, comes in perhaps uh, uh, afterwards. Um, but, you know, perhaps not always so fiercely. Um, and uh, there's a lot to be said, and people are increasingly aware of this, that the integration process, the landing process after a big psychedelic experience is, is so important. Mm. Uh, and there, if there isn't too much haste to try and stitch things back up, but rather just let them 
slowly kind of um, settle and crystallize in a way that's most natural without forcing any kind of, I don't know, psychoanalytic interpretations necessarily. And it's probably in that, that way of treating it as a sort of organic process that things settle most healthily. And, and sometimes there's, there's a, there needs to be a principle of just sitting still with some uncertainty. Perhaps things aren't so crystal clear now and perhaps things aren't so crystal clear um, uh, full stop. And so, um, you know, that often comes up actually in our therapeutic work with psychedelics where a patient might want closure on something, you know, something as literal as was I abused, you know, mm. when, and uh, there's a responsibility, I think, on our part not to force such a closure. And there are historic examples of where that's gone wrong in, in traditional psychotherapy. Right. You want an answer. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's just hard to get or not there or not, you know, yeah. not, not enough evidence to decide yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. 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 So uh, there is this also this feeling that, uh, you know, informally forgetting about scientific research, but people feel that they are getting some deep insight into themselves or into the nature of existence or something like that when they're on psychedelics. And I've always wondered how much of that is you actually have gotten an insight or you have gotten the impression that you've gotten an insight somehow. I mean, are there things that really stay with people afterward, you know, once they're no longer on the drugs that uh, are count as profound insights about themselves? There are, but that, I mean, that's, you're really hitting on the million dollar question there. Um, and uh, again, you know, the answer isn't, isn't too black and white. Sometimes people do have profound insights that stick with them, that change their lives, that they can um, communicate to other people who, who hear them and, and the message lands and resonates and they say, wow, mm. um, you know, and when that happens, often it's it feels like a deep spiritual wisdom, um, and so the resonance really is with things that one could read about in, say, Buddhism or um, uh, spiritual texts. Um, and there, it's uh, these are insights that, of course, aren't specific to psychedelics at all. They're just more um, they're more fundamental and and basic than anything to do with psychedelics. It's just, it so happened that uh, for some people, psychedelics have been the tool that have really led to whatever breakthroughs um, that people uh, um, have had. And for some, you know, spiritual teachers, uh, I guess, gurus, if you mm -hmm. want, uh, um, you know, some quite well-known ones, uh, psychedelics have actually been, especially Western ones, <laughs> psychedelics have been, you know, the, the door that's opened for them that later on, you know, what they've done with, with that um, drug-induced um, insight is to put it into spiritual practice. Right. And there I think the, the key term is, is practice, you know, mm. rather than just keep going back to the drug where after a certain period of time, maybe, you know, there's more noise to be experienced than signal. Uh, they've thought instead there's something to, to do, there's some action to follow that's, uh, that's a healthier way of, okay. of being rather than going back to, you know, the drug teacher and all the projections that right. can go uh, with that. That's, you know, there's something inherent to the drug that holds this intelligence. Like, yeah. I think that can, that can be quite a dangerous and problematic. Uh, view. Well, it's very interesting what you said about um, the sort of loosening versus tightening of your thought processes when you're on a psychedelic versus a stimulant. There, there's this long-standing informal belief that madness and creativity are somehow connected to each other, right? Uh, being creative involves looking outside the box, thinking of new things, but in some sense, you can. The box is also important, right? Like, you know, the, the ordinary rules also matter. And it's all about finding a balance between them. And are psychedelics a way of sort of moving the balance in one direction or another and then go, going back and forth? And is that useful? Yeah, I, it can be useful. Um, and, but equally, it can be uh, um, potentially problematic. 
mean, it can be useful when the, the constraints of the box are too firm uh, and, um, and it's, it's holding up uh, uh, progress and perhaps even leading to pathology, uh, whether personal or, or on a kind of systemic level, like mm. on a social level. Um, People it's do a, have bad trips, right? And does that, does that depend on the person more or the yeah, drug? Or the well, situation? they do have bad trips and sometimes they are really bad. I mean, there is this sort of uh, fashion, I suppose, in, in the psychedelic science community to say there's no such thing as a bad trip. There's oh, challenging really? experiences. They call them challenging, you know, they're things to work through and overcome. And there's a lot of truth in that. But equally, for the sake of sort of plain talking, some trips are really, really awful. So yeah. We can call them bad. They're not fundamentally bad intrinsically in and of themselves. But, but the unpleasant itself. Very like unpleasant. Yeah, hellish. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I guess as a scientist, there's some deep fascination in those experiences. And uh, to try and understand them, I would lean towards notions of the collective unconscious, you know, Carl Jung and, and archetypes, you know, around sort of demons and devils and monsters, you know, very uh, ingrained human images and ideas that are, um, yeah. So you're saying that when people have a bad trip, they, they uh, we can help understand, we can try to understand what they're going through by reference to those ideas? Absolutely. Okay. I think it's the best way to understand them. A problematic way to try and understand them would be to say that they're literally real, uh, sure. you know, to invoke notions of magic, that perhaps uh, some bad demons are in, the, you know, bad spirits are in the space or whatever. Right. Um, that kind of projecting things into some metaphysical space, I think, is part, you know, one of the kind of subtle, uh, sometimes perhaps not so subtle pitfalls of psychedelic drug use. Well, that's, you know, sometimes I get the impression that people who are advocates for this really think that they're not just discovering something new about their brains or their selves, but about the nature of reality. And I'm, I'm very skeptical about that. I'm not quite sure that the nature of reality is being revealed here. No, although they might they might have some insights about the nature of nature, possibly. Um, but then you also have these uh, there's a lot of pseudoscience that comes yeah. into this space. A lot of uh, magical notions um, and a lot of contradiction that you hear as well. People will talk about, oh, the Western approach and the scientific analytical approach and how it's so reductionist. And then they'll bring up some, you know, loose idea around the um, uh, vagus nerve that's responsible for Kundalini, right. you know, and it's just all really vague and 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 uh, horribly reductionist <laughs> as well. And yeah. So there's there are some annoying contradictions. But okay, speaking uh, of the Western scientific method, you know, here you, you're doing experiments. Why don't, why don't you describe a, an actual experiment you would do on a patient uh, by you know giving them some uh, psychedelic and looking at their brain somehow? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, we have been doing some interesting work with DMT. Um, injecting it into people and then recording to brain, volunteers, I presume, yeah, <laughs> to healthy volunteers, um, and then recording their brain activity with EEG. Uh, you know those caps that record the oscillatory activity in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, look a little bit like swimming caps yep. with sensors on, and then fMRI as well. And, and recently, we've completed. A simultaneous EEG fMRI study. Okay. One of my PhD students, Chris Timmerman, has been leading that work, and so that's quite pioneering. And and it allows us to um, bring together the um, high temporal resolution of EEG with the high spatial resolution of fMRI. Look at things like um, uh, complex patterns in the temporal activity. Um, uh, look actually literally at its complexity, at its entropy, um, but also look at um, uh, brain networks and their mm. dynamics. Uh, and there's some, some principles are emerging out of that. And then it's really as good science perhaps, or just science uh, um, does, it throws up interesting new questions um, and future studies to think about. So. We're some way through. In fact, 
the plan is to begin this uh, in the next month, in February, um, to um, begin a, a protocol um, of, uh, or actually begin the, the, the experiments themselves um, uh, following a continuous infusion protocol with DMT. So typically we we give a bolus of DMT and it rockets people into mm. this DMT space where, uh, you know, they feel so profoundly immersed in this other world that feels as real as this one, um, but is, you know, alive. Zero to 60 and, very, very quickly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And is content rich, visually incredibly rich. Um, you know, that kind of avatar type scene is uh -huh. probably inspired. Floating cities, yeah. Yeah, from ayahuasca and DMT uh, visions. Um, but it's that kind of thing. And, and people often report encountering uh, entities, seemingly sentient other beings in this DMT world. So, which is not what you would see from LSD. No, not really. No, it doesn't quite reach that intensity. LSD, I think you mentioned, is more like the things that you do see are altered, right? Yeah, instead more of, of a distortion. New things, yeah, and, and there can be sort of perhaps um, richer, kind of deeper um, notions and memories, um, personal material and transpersonal material can emerge under LSD over a longer time frame. And so therapeutically, those longer lasting psychedelics okay. like LSD and psilocybin, oral psilocybin, uh, yeah, they're, they're different in that sense. There's more therapeutic gain to be had. Whereas a DMT, IV or smoke DMT is more like this short, sharp blast into this other very weird, hyper real space. Um, so how short is short? What is a typical trip oh, last? Oh, less than 20 minutes. Less than 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. And you, but and you're meeting other sentient beings. Yes. And people come back and their whole, you know. Which you and I like to think are made up in people's brains, not yeah, actual. Yeah, I, I mean. It's a, <laughs> They're not I, angels coming down no, and visiting. No, it's a, what an exciting opportunity for studying the archetypes, yeah. I think. And, yeah. and the, you know, the dynamic uh, fabric, I suppose, of the unconscious mind. That, that was what lured me into this space. It was that very thing, really, uh, uh, when I first got into this area. Um, and, yeah, so that's yeah, obviously a huge challenge, but that's the, that's the opportunity. So just so, I mean, pe some people are not going to be experts here. These are not thought to be addictive drugs that you're giving no. people, right? So when you get volunteers, there's, we're, we're pretty sure that they're safe doing these kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, so we can go through some of the obvious things. Toxicity profile seems to be very good, especially yeah. with a compound like psilocybin, magic mushrooms. Massive therapeutic index, which is the dose that you would typically take or you might take therapeutically relative to a dose that's going to cause you harm or kill you. Massive window there. Right. You know. So it's not like a little bit extra is going to really cause no, you harm. No, whereas yeah. there are many medicines where it's a much tighter therapeutic, uh, licensed medicines, much tighter therapeutic index and legal drugs like alcohol, you know, mm. very small therapy. Well, there's no therapy. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and then we can look at, um, uh, yeah, mortality risk. They don't, you know, there's, there's no risk to your physiology where this, this drug's going to kill you. Right. Um, uh, as, at least with a compound like psilocybin. Um, then we can look at addiction potential, negligible addiction yeah. potential. Animals don't self-administer psychedelics. They seem, if anything, to be fundamentally aversive. And humans uh, only really go there where well, they can make mistakes and, and try and take them for recreation, for fun. But then they get a rude awakening and they realize that it's true these aren't party drugs and they shouldn't have <laughs> taken LSD at the party. Yeah. Yeah, so they're more drugs of sort of self-exploration when taken in the right way. Um, and then people, you know, uh, often do those explorations quite sparingly. They might do it a couple of times a year if they consider themselves a psychedelic user. Um, I mean, my impression is that there's really no standard across which alcohol should be ready, readily available, but LSD should be banned. I mean, there's really no danger that you get from LSD that you wouldn't also get in there's much There's a behavioral form. danger. I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. What, what kind of behavioral danger? Well, if you're, uh, you know, if you're on a high dose of LSD or psilocybin 
and confused and things are distorted and all this powerful emotional material is coming up, you probably shouldn't be wandering around in an urban center right. where there's traffic and such like. Or maybe in a position of responsibility for other people. Yeah, with your like children that. or something. Yeah, yeah. That's so good. there are some risks there. And there's also the psychological vulnerability which should be considered a risk. Uh, and for that reason, it's so strongly emphasized and, it, and it's so important that it is that the psychedelic be taken in the right kind of context. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that involves uh, not just the context for the immediate experience, but also ahead of time that you come into the experience with some intention and preparation and forethought and also um, some planning for the aftercare as well, the landing. Um, and, uh, you know, and so if those things are covered, then all of a sudden one could make quite a rational case for, I think, opening up access to uh, safe use of psychedelics within certain centers, for example. Uh, when you bring patients in, do you give them some sort of psychological test to make sure they're in a good place to do this kind of experiment? Yeah, we do. I mean, we do careful screening. Um, of course, if they're patients, they're often not in a good place. I shouldn't say patients, but volunteers for the experiments. Yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah. If, if they are in a period of, of psychological distress, then if it's a healthy volunteer study, they would be excluded because it starts to blur the... Uh, Causality, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, and the lines between what's a healthy volunteer study and a, and a patient study. Sure, you know, one could question that, that distinction anyway. Sure. But if your if your question is how does how does a certain psychedelic work in the brain, you probably don't want to blur that with some kind of therapeutic study. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned Aldous Huxley before. Um, he famously took what was it was it LSD as he was dying. He was dying of cancer. It was very very painful. He asked to be administered LSD, and apparently it made his passing much gentler and yeah. more pleasant. Is that yeah. one of the future therapeutic uses, end of life care that we might imagine? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and so um, NYU and Johns Hopkins have done some really important work there. Charlie Grobe at UCLA and Peter Gasser in Switzerland. So there's quite a few studies, and probably most of the recent clinical trials and actually the best designed clinical trials have been these studies in end-of-life distress uh, with double-blind randomized control trials you know the gold standard for uh, uh, clinical trials in terms of scientific rigor those designs um, and uh, yeah there the results have been very compelling so rapid and enduring improvements in the main mental health outcomes, which have been depressive and anxiety symptoms. Um, so very quick and lasting reductions in those. And so put a more of a human spin on it, you know, people uh, report feeling much more uh, at ease with the inevitable, mm. uh, their inevitable passing. Um, and they view death, their death, uh, perhaps even death more generally as, as something not to be so frightened of. Um, I, I presume there are some, there's a sort of moralistic attitude in some people that that would be bad, that you should be resisting death uh, no matter what, and therefore yeah. you should face it as naturally as possible. But I'm, yeah. I'm very much in the camp that it, it is uh, something that you should try to come to terms with, right? Come yeah, to peace with. well, it's inevitable and... Perhaps there's some, yeah, there's some grace to dying well and some humility. Uh, but sure, you know, you rage, rage against the dying <laughs> light and all that kind of thing. But, yeah, but, I mean, who's saying that often? Is it the loved one who doesn't want you to pass, but maybe there's true compassion in saying, I want you to pass peacefully. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, very, very human work in that space and uh, and use universally relevant as well. Well, you mentioned this idea of taking psychedelics in a controlled environment, you know, a few times a year or whatever. I mean, what do you what do you foresee as the long term 
good balance about how this stuff is used. So you don't you shouldn't take LSD before you go to a party. That that seems to be yeah. something that you're saying. But what do you think is the is the correct you know social role for these kinds of things? Yeah. If you were the boss of the world and could set all the rules, <laughs> uh, uh, well, there are some red flags. Yeah, don't don't take them at a party. Um, be mindful about the dosage that you take. Um, don't take them for escape. That's a really important one. I think it is an important one. I mean, maybe that's worth emphasizing. It's yeah. it's still you, right? Yeah, you're still facing yourself. You are, and and everything underneath. You know, the sort of. Um, ego self right maybe you're facing yourself more clearly <laughs> yeah yeah and that can be really where the where the terror comes <laughs> eye-opening yes yeah um and uh so for me i think the rollout would be these centers um where there is regulation uh i i wouldn't advocate for so the decriminalization initiatives that are going on at the moment um are interesting and you can make the argument that people shouldn't be, you know, um, uh, punished or even incarcerated for exploring their own consciousness and such like, and perhaps even doing therapeutic work Mm -hmm. that could turn their lives around in a healthy way. Um, Perhaps make them better citizens, you know. So sure, you could argue that, but is decriminalization really the right way for this to roll out? I think... Um, initiatives that are thinking more carefully about the rollout of psychedelic therapy, uh, whether that be the plant medicines themselves or or the product following the classic regulatory route. Obviously, well, obviously, in my view, they they're you know much more thoughtful and, and a much healthier way that this can roll out. Um, and there, the vision, the shared vision, is of centers that are carefully managed professionally managed where you have uh key ingredients like careful screening of people Mm -hmm. coming in for vulnerabilities to identify those red flags you know if someone's on the cusp of a psychotic break perhaps they shouldn't be taking a big dose of psilocybin which could uh, tip the balance um in a negative way uh um, and yeah, to have mental health professionals there um, and to take care of the preparation and the supervision during the experience that people are in a very safe container with ingredients, environmental ingredients in that space that we think are important, like music and carefully crafted music. Uh, and then the aftercare as well, mm-hmm. you know, and if those things are in place, it's actually my view, and I don't mind saying this these days, that the access uh, to that model could be in very broad, not just people who have, you know, fit into whatever diagnostic category, but maybe, you know, um, people who are well as well mm-hmm. uh, that could benefit from uh, still the effect on their psychological well-being how it might help keep them well um, and uh, have other, uh, you know, subtle advantages in terms of, uh, yeah, living well and feeling connected to other people. I think, I mean, it's an interesting angle to go down to, to imagine that intelligent use of psychedelics could just be part of living mentally well like keeping up your own mental health is that is that something that makes sense yes it does yeah. it does and there's a huge case to be made there where the burden of mental illness is so massive that you can make a case around prophylaxis or preventative measures mm-hmm. uh, that can improve things like resilience the ability to have some flex when times get really tough um, uh, help put things in perspective um, and again these are hopefully effects that are not just while you're on the trip but you know can linger no, on afterwards these are about yeah afterwards really and and there again you know tying the psychedelic experience in with other things that are healthy like you know healthy living healthy mm. diet um, uh, cultivating a, a healthy attitude you know healthy literature in a sense and Mm -hmm. and practices maybe things like meditation yoga um 
uh, that's where the rollout could work um, best, I think. It does sound like something that would be hard to establish scientifically. I mean, how much do we know, even if you can do an fMRI study to see which parts of the brain are lighting up, how much do we know about the long-term mental health benefits of being or having these experiences? Well, we can look at uh, other studies. Uh, um, we can look at population studies. We can do cohort studies where we track people over an extended period. And we've started doing those. So we've set up what I believe will be an incredibly valuable resource. It's already valuable, but I think the future is going to be really exciting for it. It's called psychedelicsurvey.com. Uh, and through that, we try and collect naturalistic data in a prospective way. So that means that we collect data before the psychedelic trip and uh, afterwards as well, rather than just doing the classic survey thing, which is to collect everything in retrospect. Yeah. And there you can't make any inferences about causality and such like. So this is about tracking people and ideally tracking big numbers so we can get big data. And then, you know, the great merit of big data is that you can see trends that are otherwise quite difficult to see. You know, it's very much a popular topic in, in medicine and uh, science more generally uh, at the moment, big data. Uh, so, yeah, and, and there, you know, we're picking up some obvious red flags at the moment and different variables that predict responses. Um, but that's the kind of thing that's needed, you know, that, that high throughput if we're going to be able to um, best mitigate uh, risks mm -hmm. and learn how to optimize delivery of, of psychedelic experiences. And what are the, for, if it's if it's one thing that so ordinary healthy people, we all have neuroses, we all have things we can be better at. So maybe this is part of our uh, mental health care regime or regimen. <laughs> what are the more obvious mental health problems that people have for which psychedelics might be the part of the cure? Well, again, you know, this is uh, a space where psychedelics, where the, the buzz that's, that's surrounding psychedelics now is warranted, I feel, because, um, you know, for, for so long, uh, people, you know, probably motivated by the drugs industry have been looking for uh, magic bullets that can come in and target specific diagnoses with specific chemical actions and then you'll be cured <laughs> yeah and and the reality is it that hasn't it's worked not like that yeah no it's not like that uh, and so with psychedelic therapy sure it's it's early phase data these are just small pilot studies really um but that's improving um and it's it's you know soon there's going to be some really compelling data out there um but Part of the picture is that there's a lot of different indications, a lot of different disorders that psychedelics are showing signal for depression, treatment resistant depression, uh, anxiety, end of life, uh, uh, distress, um, addictions and different varieties, uh, drinking, alcohol, uh, tobacco, uh, now eating disorders. So okay. we're starting a trial this year. Hopkins have already started. Uh, we think chronic pain, others think chronic pain too. The psychological aspect of pain we think could be quite um, effectively treated with psychedelic therapy. Um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, there's some preliminary data uh, on that. And so, you know, short of wanting to sound like I'm selling a panacea, it's necessary to try and explain why this might be the case that psychedelic therapy has what we call a trans diagnostic action right it's not a single thing for which it's, it's not, good yeah not a single indication that it works for there seems to be a lot i did want to i forgot to emphasize this possibility of treating addiction because of course i think in the popular imagination drugs are addicting but in fact psychedelics seem to be useful in curing people of it on from being addicted to other drugs is that right yeah that's right yeah so an interesting paradox there's quite a few things that that should really challenge people's and maybe this is part of the jumping out of a rut cognitively yes this is it and and this brings us to the explanation of why psychedelic therapy could be transdiagnostic in action in that a lot of these disorders involve ruts you know, whether they're behavioral ruts, you know. Depression especially. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, behavioral ruts, addiction uh, um, is very true in that sense, in that you're there's like a gravitational pull to the object of relief, you know, whatever it is, um, and the withdrawal and all the uncertainty and turmoil when it's not there, you know. Um, and then with depression, um, Matt Johnson said, you know, psychedelic therapy could be useful for addiction broadly defined. And I quite like mm. that because in a sense, in addiction, in uh, depression, uh, the addiction, if you want, is the pessimism uh, it becomes so practiced, so habitual, uh, so heavily weighted. The gravitational pull is so strong that it's like a literal depression, you know, it pulls you in into that rut and then it's hard to get out and if you're out you're vulnerable to falling back in again you know and so uh, with psychedelic therapy uh, the um, therapeutic mechanism uh, um, we think is that it's almost as if the landscape if you have a literal depression like a hole mm -hmm. um, uh, that starts a to rut, flatten yeah, yeah the rut mm -hmm. flattens and now the landscapes flatter you can explore you can move more freely. You can see more, you know, because the earth's lifted up. You can see outside of of the hole um, and uh, all the possibilities there. Um, Sometimes increasing entropy is useful, yeah. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Controlled increase in entropy. Uh, I mean, that's the lesson that I'm learning from all of this is that, you know, the a, a, a well-functioning brain or mind is kind of all about the balance right between a little bit of organization a little bit of freedom a little bit of randomness and yeah. and sometimes that balance gets out of whack and maybe psychedelics can push us in one direction when that's appropriate yeah and it's probably a universal principle that goes beyond mental health and and the brain of you know destruction breeding new organization yeah. that in some way is better in, in inverted commas. So what is so just to, to wrap things up, I mean, what is the scientific frontier? What is it what you want to see being done at labs like yours? If you know, if you're a pioneer here, what do you want to see being done around the world? What do we need to understand about the relationship between psychedelics and the brain, for example? Yeah, there's a couple of things to say. I think a demystification process where there is this pitfall around magical thinking and pseudoscience coming into this space. I think it'd be so healthy, actually, it would sound paradoxical, but on a spiritual level to understand uh, what's going on in this aspect of nature, the human brain, when people have these very profound um, spiritual experiences under, under psychedelics. And that will, you know, be hugely um, uh, pioneering and progressive for understanding the brain and the mind and spiritual experiences. And I think that will have a lot of healthy uh, uh, implications. There'll be some resistance to it. I think mm -hmm. that's a shame, but I don't, I, I, I'm confident that the, uh, the naturalistic um, approach will win out. Um, I mean, it has historically. Right. <laughs> um, and there will, so there will be this healthy demystification uh, which is good, paradoxically, for spiritual practice, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, so I hope that plays out. Um, and uh, another thing is that I hope that uh, the mainstream doesn't push back too hard, but embraces this. Uh, but there's a lot of areas in which psychedelic therapy and psychedelic science uh, pushes against convention. So many, you know, whether yeah. it's depth psychology oh well that's you know uh hasn't been a dominant force in psychology and, and neuroscience for a long time so that's challenging and then uh drugs you know they're not everyone's cup of tea <laughs> so we have to work around the fact that these are drug assisted psychotherapies and we right. put aside our our um our biases whether they're towards biomedical models or psychotherapy models and try and talk to each other and get on with this hybrid biopsychosocial model. Um, and uh, what else do we have? Uh, well, there's so much mental health itself, you know, and the stigma there. Um, and then I, I think there's a lot of conventions in, in mainstream science and psychiatry and medicine 
that could be challenged with psychedelic therapy, like the way that you do a traditional clinical trial where you pick out a specific indication, you constrain everything around these inclusion and exclusion criteria, and then because usually of, of financial reasons, you run a very small trial that throws up you know, a limited uh, data set in terms mm -hmm. of its richness. Whereas if you could set up a trial that um, perhaps looks at a range of different indications or a very broad population, let's say, you know, healthies all the way up to depressed with yeah. all the neuroticism in between. Um, and uh, yeah, it's the same intervention, but maybe you can allow some adaptability in the parameters, maybe the dose, the dosage and the dosing sessions and maybe also the integration care and the therapeutic models could be tweaked and played with. So that, that's consistent with what's called an adaptive trial. Um, and also the idea of a broad population uh, is consistent with what's called a, a basket or basket uh, trial, uh, where you're putting a lot of different things in the same basket with the same intervention. Oh, yeah. okay. So that kind of thing's done in oncology where you would have a number of different cancers with the same intervention. Why not psychiatry? Yeah. You know, uh, one of the reasons why not probably is it slightly flies in the face, or it seems to, of this fashion around precision medicine. Okay. People will say, where's the precision there? But uh, I think there's, there's a lot to be said for the exploration and the benefits that can come from that liberal uh, um, explorative approach to the science at this stage, particularly as it's quite young science it's it's somehow like 50 years uh of, of missed opportunity because you know it's been difficult to do this research yeah yeah it is and so there's a huge amount to be done and i think you know the progress will benefit if we don't constrain things too too heavily but it sounds like you're optimistic that things are changing and we're going to start using this stuff more intelligently yeah but very optimistic of course you know you can be jackknifed when uh when you're looking in one direction with optimism and then, you know, yeah. it's, something comes along and really pushes back and that's yet to happen and we haven't seen what it's going to look like. It probably will happen. But I, I mean, what gives me confidence is the conviction in the, in, in the model and the value of the tool. All right, Robin Carhart-Harris, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you.